then and you can see the chat right i can if i click this i can uh let me oh. it's here where'd my chat go it was oh chat there we go i'll hit it now got it oh yeah i got me a poster already awesome but i'll need that later okay Hey, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Extra Featured Editor. Today, I have a fabulous director whose film, Jane Kennedy, Interception, American Sportcaster. See, I got it right this time. Uh, Sophia, I can't even say your last name. I'm going to try. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, welcome. So, welcome. You have a fabulous doc. I mean, this thing should be seen. It means a lot to me because I do remember it as a kid. So let's start at the beginning. How did you know about Jane? I mean, you look a little young to me to know about her, so. Sure, so um, I, Jane Kennedy was and is an actress and she was also a model. And so she did a whole lot of stuff and you're right. She did all these things before I came to the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but in those first decades of her life, from when she came out of high school to her very early 20s, she just hit Hollywood by storm. And so she was an actress and she was a model and she was on the Dean Martin show and Rowan and Martin's laughing. And then she had this opportunity that was actually not available to her because she was African-American. There was an opportunity to become the newest sportscaster on CBS NFL today. And they were not bringing African-American, or they were not auditioning African-American women for the role. So the role originally was filled by Phyllis George, who is the first female sportscaster in American television. She's a former Miss America, and she was a great talent, but she left the show, leaving a space on the desk, and they refused to fill it with anyone but um, a white woman. And Jane decided that she was the right person for the job. <laughs> And the film is about all the things that she had to go through to just convince people to audition her. And then after that, just trying to constantly prove herself over and over again against racism that was just really unrelenting racism. So the film is about how she did it. And the same way that you play football, right? and there's all these different, um, the opposing team is trying to tackle you and keep you away from the goal and keep you, you know, at the yard line where you are and not advancing to the, the yard line where you want to be. That's more or less what she had to do in her position as a sportscaster, because people, so many different people were not willing to bring her um, into that position with open arms. They were not even willing to audition her for that position. So the film is about what this, what a, a person who is a first, an American first, who breaks the color line, uh, just like Jackie Robinson did and many other people had to do. Uh, this is about the first African-American female sportscaster. She's not the first African-American sportscaster. That would be Irv Cross. Irv Cross is also, was also um, an anchor on CBS NFL Today. However, she's the first African-American woman and that intersectionality, if you will, of being African-American and a woman, that's a special category <laughs> of discrimination that uh, may not always be felt by African-American men or by you know, you know, Caucasian women, even though they certainly are you know, having their battles uh, to go forward and their, their uh, purpose in life and the things that they're pursuing. The relationship with America and African-American women is uh, it needs to be explored, <laughs> and this film does explore that. So, so I got to start out when you were reading about Jane. Why Jane? Like, what drew you to? I mean, it's a fabulous story. I get that, but you're not there yet. I mean, you know mm -hmm. she exists. So, how do you get to the point? Yep, yeah, that's what I want to do. Oh, sure. So I found um, there was a grant for interesting stories that dealt with sports, and so I reached. I applied for the grant, and I reached out to Jane at the same time that I was applying. She didn't get back to me. <laughs> I had to submit whatever I could find online to get the grant. And then she called me back maybe a few days after I had already submitted. And so I thought I knew her story based on what was online. And then when she called me back, mind you, the application had already been submitted. It was anything but what I thought it was and what I realized the world thought it was. So when people win different things and they're the first person and you know they they become the 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 first face to do something, we often think that they are everything was roses, you know, like once they were accepted everything went really well. And when in the pre-interview that I just talked to her on the telephone for maybe like 2 or 3 hours wow. and everything she said, I was like, "Oh my gosh." Then they I mean I always I was like that then what happened? Then what happened? Every Everything was just, it, it was just worse and worse and worse. I was like, you had to go through all of that. And the camera came on and you had to smile and act like none of that was happening. So I really wanted to show the emotional roller coaster that people go through who are brave enough 
right? To put themselves out there and endure the pain, the humility, the disrespect, um, just all the different transgressions against your mind, your your soul, your spirit, your heart, your feelings, your mind, your everything, you know, all the different things that make it so that you have the strength to go back out and do something. And I really wanted to show that she, I wanted to show what it looks like before the victory. Right? And so, and also I wanted, I wanted her philosophy of, you know, the, the way that her mind works. I wanted to show the mind of a winner um, because that's what, that's all that you really have is, you know, your philosophy on life at any given time, that will be the reason why you're going through all the things that you're going through. So, you know, the, the responsibility so much is on your perspective on life, your, your determination to be happy, your determination to be um, successful in terms of what you were put on the planet to do. And, and Jane has an incredible philosophy and that's the reason why she's been able to persevere. And we can all apply that to our respective lives, whatever we're doing in life. So besides that, when you were doing your initial interview, I mean, two or three hours on the phone with somebody, it's a long time for somebody I don't know. I mean, you've done research, obviously. Um, did something surprise you that did make your documentary? Like something like, wow, I didn't expect that and I can't use it. Oh, did anything surprise me? So I, I, I do know Jane Kennedy before. I did know Jane Kennedy before, um, but I didn't know the story. I didn't know this particular story. And I knew of all her other accomplishments, but I didn't know um, what she had to go through to become the first sportscaster, first African-American female sportscaster. And so did anything surprise me? Everything surprised me. <laughs> I was like, what, 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 what? She essentially, I mean, when you're dealing with all the different types of discrimination that can happen in the workplace, Jane dealt with all of it. Like whatever that, whatever booklet they have in HR, she dealt with every page of discrimination that you can face from the second that she auditioned to when she got there. And I, what I was, I guess, most surprised about is how she's such a, a physically beautiful woman. She's a very elegant woman, period, just eternally this way. And then she, but there's this whole world behind all of it that she has to contend with so that she is um, mentally prepared to deal with people trying to stab her in the back, people trying to um, pull the rug out from under her. So I really appreciated just watching someone who was very like um, careful about the things that she stated and at the time in particular, the way that she approached things she's um her strategy is superior she has a superior strategy to live life i learned a lot about how to live life and i, I and it's like it's funny because like i watch my film all the time because it's in festivals now but it's like i i still cry at my own film which is like bizarre but i still cry at the same points because i'm like gosh like why did she have to go through all that like why did anyone have to go through all of those things and it just makes me not complain about whatever, whatever i'm going through and so i was surprised at my reaction to her story and how it is Kind of eternally motivating and i think other people feel the same way it's you know it's doing really, really well and people are responding you know it's just it's, she's just a really inspirational person and i think that most people see her as someone who is just beautiful and attractive and all of that but she is i told her actually i emailed her a few weeks ago and i was like you're no different than muhammad ali you're no different than dr king and malcolm x you make people feel like they should stand taller and push harder for what they came here to do and the and the love that she that people pour on her she she feels the same way about all the people that support her and her fans and people who you know illustrate to her what she means to them she feels the same way about her fan base and she has a really dedicated fan base her fan base they are like they draw pictures of her they make all these like you know they people are always honoring jane and they send stuff to her and she'll post it on her facebook page or her instagram you know fan art and so the the feeling of love is quite she really you know appreciates everyone who she may not meet but she but she knows that they're supporting her and she lets them know you know how much she appreciates them and really genuinely loves them. So I think that's what surprised me the most is the effect that she would have on me and, and audiences in terms of being an inspirational force. Okay, you've done your research, you're ready to go. You just have that last thing, which I always call prepping your questions. How did you work your questions? I mean, that's a very hard thing to do. I have to do it every time I do an interview. So I mean, they're always different. So how do you prep questions? Sure, so I did a pre-interview and I am a journalist, you know, my background, I'm a filmmaker and a journalist uh -huh. and a news anchor and a news reporter. 
as well as a producer and writer for television, talk shows, long form documentaries and daily news broadcasts. So this is what I do for a living and I teach other people how to do it too. But I did a, I did the pre-interview with her and then from there, I didn't just ask questions. I actually decided I needed different versions of the answer. So I asked her to give me an answer that was specific where it was like hard numbers and data and actual solid stuff, but I wasn't going to include anything in the film that I couldn't corroborate with an outside source in terms of the facts. Any time that she spoke about her emotions, I could use all, all of that because that those were her feelings. But if she said, for example, she's like, well, I graduated high school in you know, 1975, I had to also get either her diploma or her high school yearbook. <laughs> I wasn't going to put that statement in the film unless I had it corroborated. And then, so the other version might be, uh, you know, when I graduated from high school, so I didn't have such a specific answer, I could still use it. So I had to have at least two different directions so I could uh, fill in a part of the story and, and be accurate. I was really, I really, because of the accusations of, um, I guess, discrimination, I needed to make sure that it, it, you know, there was some corroboration for all of the factual components of the film. And then emotionally, you know, she could always talk about everything and how it, how she felt. But like, for example, she talked, there was a court case that came up, that came about as a result of what she went through. I had to find the court case, you know, every, everything that happened, I had to go in and find the actual documents and read through them. And it, that, that was actually what was the most time consuming. <laughs> it was so time consuming. Oh my God. No one understands, but it was like, I had, I had four different researchers and research librarians trying to find every, every point in the story. I have a, I have a script essentially of what the, um, of the beats of this, of this, this version of the film, which is short and every fact I had to give it to someone, one of the research librarians or the PhD, there's uh, four African-American studies professors who worked on this as well. And I'm like, can you find me anything that corroborates this statement that she makes here? So she made a statement and there was fact, I wanted to use the factual version. I had to find one other thing that said the same thing, and then I could use it in the film. So those are my standards. <laughs> So wow, that's a if lot of work for a documentary <laughs> filmmaker. So, did you I, find uh, you're doing your work to the next level? I mean, most I don't find most documentaries spend this much time on research. Usually it's just find a subject, film it, obviously have questions prepared and do that. But I mean, how much time did this take in the editing process then? Well, once I, the editing process included transcribing everything and I had to put notes next to something. So if she said something and she was laughing or she was crying or she said it in a way that, you know, like I, if there was a certain tone that she used and like it would say she said something in a sarcastic tone, I would put notes next to everything. So I had to, I had to transcribe all eight hours of footage myself and then put the notes in there. And then from there, I then built a script based on the transcript and then highlighted all the facts, which I then had to research with a small army of, <laughs> of historians, but we were all running around trying to find an article from People Magazine or, you know, a TV guide article and uh, having all these different moments. And then sometimes I couldn't, I was like, where would this footage be? Like, and I had to search like where, what would be the keywords for this particular clip? And, and because the, the editing in the film, we go back and forth between modern time and the B-roll very fast. Like it's always very interwoven, mat, lots of match cuts. That was another thing too, during the shooting of the film, whenever she said something, I had her act it out to camera. So she breaks the fourth wall uh, several times. So there's like a, a sequence with Muhammad Ali and Muhammad Ali says, you know, I'll only do this for my friend Jane. And he punches into the camera. I was like, do you mind punching into the camera? And so she did, she punched into the camera. And so I intercut between Muhammad Ali punching into the camera and Jane Kennedy punching into the camera. So that's one of the reasons why people really like the film is because of the, it's it, the editing is very, very tight. Like it's very um, paced out well. It is edgy. It makes, it feels like you're watching a sporting event. <laughs> a lot of documentaries are very flat. And, you know, you're just like watching the sunrise for 20 minutes or something. But for my film, it's very fast paced and it's very quick. And I want people to feel like she had to feel every day going into work where you're like, okay, I don't know what is in front of me, but I have to think fast. I wanted people to have to feel that way. So yeah, the editing process, most of it was paper editing. <laughs> Like before I ever got it, like I had to do a, like four different versions of paper editing before I even started pulling the footage. And then I just had bins of B-roll shots and still photography that matched under different folders. So like this particular beat in the story, this picture shows her walking down the street in New York. I need something that says she went to the audition. Like I need something that says behind the scenes. I need all these different clips to match a story beat. So 
yeah, I wrote a script and then I, I had all these uh, video assets that were layered, you know, so like when she gets, she gets this letter in the mail and I had to find a letter from CBS with Jane Kennedy on it. And I'm like, where do I find this? I went on eBay. <laughs> I, like, I got to find the image. Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I had to go and find stuff all over the place and I don't even know how I found all of it. I really don't. I just, I went wild with uh, trying to make sure I had imagery because mind you, none of this stuff was digitized. You know, this is all coming from a time where none of that existed. So whatever I got lucky enough to find that someone had digitized, I was like, oh, this is perfect. So I found, I got magazines from, a lot of magazines from eBay, actually. I had to go find the 1979, 1978 magazine, buy it, wait for it to come in the mail, and then digitize it. <laughs> you know, like it was, that was normal. So I have all these, if anyone wants any magazines from 1978, I got a lot. Um. At one point, she avoids the Jimmy the Greek question. And I mean, I thought that was a big yes. question you asked. And I thought it was a very, I wanted that answer. I really did. And she avoids it. And I mean, she kind of passes it off. And I don't even know if Jimmy the Greek is still alive, but she said he'll answer it. How did that feel you as a, a filmmaker that she didn't answer your question? Oh, I mean, she answered the question in the sense that she said their relationship, you know, the relationship that- That was not the question they, you asked though. Have. Yeah, I mean, well, Jimmy the Greek was, so essentially they brought him on the show to uh, balance out the fact that they were going to have two black people in one white Ridiculous to show. me and, looking back at that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, but the, he wasn't just a, just a person there to balance. He was, you know, very uh, vociferous, if you will. <laughs> like he, he expressed his racism in, in a very neon oh right way and uh you know it was very very hurtful statements um and i do actually remember people talking about that so when i was a kid i remember people talking about jimmy the greek like i remember people talking about how he made these statements and i had never seen the footage before i didn't even know what they were talking about <laughs> like i was you know i was a kid like i was legit i knew i knew his name was interesting and i knew that black people were really upset about something he said on tv so then when i went to research you know what that was about of course for this film I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is the person she had to work with all the time. And he, you can, I can see it in the footage, you know, he gives her all this kind of, you know, he ignore, he doesn't make eye contact with her on set. You know, I've watched hours and hours and hours of footage and he is really, he may not be disrespectful in what he says to her, but he makes it incredibly difficult to work with him. And so she, that's why she didn't want to talk about it and he's just angry all the time. I mean, he's angry all the time and that's more or less what that was his reputation. And then it comes to a head later on, I mean, years after they, they were on the show together in 1987, he makes these statements about black athletes and you know, likening their performance to breeding animals. And that's all that they are. They're just animals that were bred in slavery and that's why they're successful. So, you know, he's like, uh, no, no recognition, no respect for their talent, their training, their hours and hours and hours of perfecting, you know, what they did as, as football players or basketball players, what have you. He just likens us to chattel, you know, to the, the chattel that we were considered to be in slavery. So that was the, um, you know, statement that had everybody, I guess, upset for sure, you know, in the late eighties and he lost it. I think he lost his job as a result of that. He did. He I remember it. It was one week yeah. he said it the next week he was gone. So it wasn't like they waited. I, I remember that distinctly. Cause I remember, I don't know. I think I was too young to say if I knew Jimmy, the Greek was racist. I mean, I just, I was young. So, I mean, I was watching football. That was just the people I watched them. Oh, Jimmy, the Greek got fired. Oh, that's weird. Not really <laughs> at the time. Remember, now looking back what he said absolutely but yeah. that was 12 or 13 racism didn't really exist for me yeah and in canada so it doesn't my world now <laughs> for no. sure it was a lot better in canada but it was not and they loved the fact that he was like that that was you know they just they yes. didn't want him to say it on a hot microphone and he That's did it. he said it and he said it randomly i mean he probably was like inebriated and at a you know oh, he was at some event <laughs> And also it was from his generation. I mean, that was how many people felt exactly like he felt, but he, you know, you just weren't supposed to say it on a hot mic and he did and he lost his job, but he, he certainly was on the CBS NFL today for a lot longer than Jane was, you know, they he left, was. they kept him on. Yeah. Okay. Jane brings up black people's hair, which I never thought was an issue. I thought that was fascinating. 
And she <laughs> says the hair argument, black people can wear their hair natural. And I'm like, she looks great. So for me, watching your documentary, that shocked me. Did it shock you? I'm like, she looks oh, fine. No. Like I have no issues. So maybe just being a Canadian, I don't see that enough. I need to move to Canada. You are making the best case for Canada. Um, well, yeah, they, it's it's definitely not shocking for me. I was a TV news reporter and anchor for a long time, and they most stations would not let me wear my hair natural. We most African American women who are TV personalities they end up uh, either pressing or relaxing their hair, which one's a chemical treatment, which also can lead to cancer, right? And then the pressing the hair damages the hair, and then a lot of people wear extensions and weaves and wigs, all of which look fake and are not really flattering. Um, and there was a brief little window of time where African Americans, and I would say like in the late '70s, there were some anchor people who wore like afros, and you know, just because that was on TV. But after that window of time, it was expected that you were going to go into some, you know, straightened hairstyle. And so there was a moment in the film where she um, had to run between two different, uh, she was, she had to run to Puerto Rico and then come back to the States to cover a game. And her hair was natural and her natural hair is, you know, thick and billowy and it's, you know, it's beautiful, but they called her and they're like, don't ever do that again. So, you know, a lots of women on African American women on TV, and specifically African American women. I mean, I don't think that other groups of women are really going through this, uh, who are TV personalities. They could dye their hair blonde, they could dye it brown or red or some other color, but no one's making them do this. And that still isn't changing the texture of the hair. The texture of the hair, you know, when Black women change the texture of their hair, it can compromise their long term health as well as it's expensive. <laughs> so it's expensive. And in addition to that, after years and years of chemical treatment, that can lead to breast cancer, can lead to ovarian cancer, can lead to different types yeah, of cancers no. that we're just yeah. finding out about now. Yeah. And you know, th that's not something people think about when they're trying to get a job, but that's, uh, that's what, you know, it's just so layered. It's just a really layered racism. I treat my films, uh, films about discrimination, I treat them like they're true crime documentaries because I feel like racism is a crime. And whether the law agrees or not at the particular time, it's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against people's pursuit of happiness. And we all lose as a society when we suppress people because of any type of ism, because you're making it so that someone who could help us out, you know, as a, as a people, <laughs> <laughs> they're they're not going to be given the resources that they need to prevail and we all lose um so i look at it like it's a true crime what happened i think it's a crime what happened to to jane at this particular time and that's how i approach the edit that's how i approach the story and i didn't want people to feel like oh well that's the way it was back then and you know tough luck i want people to recognize that a crime was committed i guess that perfect to lead to my next question why do you think she got fired because from what I saw and what I remember, she was doing fine for me. I don't remember her upsetting me in any way. She was a host. She did a good job. But I can remember as a kid. Yeah. Uh, the reason she was um, fired was because they wanted to bring Phyllis George back. So because ah, they wanted okay. to bring Phyllis George back, they tried to blame Jane Kennedy uh, for every and all things so that they could put the onus on her for the firing. And then they could say, okay, well, she did something and let's get rid of her. And now let's bring Phyllis George back. So Phyllis George was married to um, Jim, I'm sorry, not Jim, John, John Y. Brown. And John Y. Brown, yeah, he's the governor of Kentucky. And as a governor of Kentucky, he had access to the Kentucky Derby, right? So CBS wanted to have access to the Kentucky Derby above all the uh. other networks. And what better way than to bring the first lady of Kentucky back as a host, and then they'd have the in in that way. And, you know, they were, um, which is, which is understandable, but the, the, you know, to want all of those things, I completely understand where the network is coming from, but to blame Jane as in fine reason to, you know, it's got, it's just a form of gaslighting to constantly try to make it so that you're the reason and it's not her fault. It was never her fault. Um, but they tried to make it her fault and, and put the firing on her shoulders, uh, you know, as if she did something wrong and, you know, it was very painful. To, to think that you are doing your, your great job and then people are, you know, messing with your head, trying to make you feel like you you did something wrong. And I mean, the film definitely talks about what she had to go through in that respect. Okay, so let's go I, I think she, that that's really important. People to see. She leaves CBS and then goes, I want to ask about the Jane Kennedy workout show. 
what yeah. is this you yeah, don't Jane, really um, go into it you just sort of do me nothing wrong with you i know you're not focusing on that your documentary i was like what is that okay. so did you watch these videos was mm -hmm. it a 30-minute show what is that yeah um so at the time there so jack lalane is uh one of the main oh. people who started the home workout craze and then after that, there were lots of people who were competing, you know, for that market where people would stay at home and work out with whatever they had in their house. And so Jane Fonda was one of the workout people along with uh, Richard Simmons. And then Jane Kennedy was the third highest, um, I guess, most purchased for a workout show. Um, so you could buy the tapes or you could watch it live on TV. And so she was number three in the country after Jane Fonda and Richard Simmons, and then it was Jane Kennedy. So it was called Love Your Body. It also had albums, like there was a Love Your Body record, there was a Love Your Body VHS tape, and they're, they're still, you know, they're out there. <laughs> you can find them. But um, she was really popular. You know, it was a really popular workout show. And, you know, Jane is an Amazon. She's like 5'10", 5'11", very well-proportioned person. So people were watching. I'm sure some people weren't exercising at all. <laughs> they were just watching Jane work out, but other people probably did work out alongside alongside her and it was just another extension of her sports casting career and she also hosted a show called greatest sports legends and that show made her the first woman to ever have a sports show to host a sports show by herself so greatest sports legends was happened directly after um, cbs nfl today and she also got the Rose Bowl parade and she was, she won an Emmy for her work on the, uh, the, uh, like the live, it's a live broadcast that lasts for like several hours. So she was awarded, she was a host of the, she was a co-host of that. And she did win an Emmy for that. And she was nominated for a number of NAACP awards and other Emmys. She was nominated for other Emmys and stuff. So her work was, you know, she was being recognized at the time. And the workout show was just a way for her to come into people's homes on a daily basis. And you know, improve their lives in the workout space. And, you know, now we have like, I guess, eventually like Billy Blanks came along and then like Insanity and P90X and all these other shows and those infomercials. And yeah, but it was, it was new then. And there were only really like three people and Jack Lane. I would say Jack Lane was probably the first person. And then there were three other people who kind of dominated the eighties. Let's work out. I've now found you set, set up yourself perfectly with a nice, easy ending with the song. It kind of put me out perfectly out to pasture, I want to say, because I was happy. I was enjoying the song works. I And you have a clip of Jane singing the song. So it's a clip from YouTube or did she have the clip? And I have more questions oh, about the song. Yeah. What is yeah. this song? Like, I'd never heard it before. You never heard of uh, I Am Woman uh, by Helen Is Reddy that what she's that. singing? Yeah. Okay. I, I then I didn't get that. I totally missed that. I'm sorry. Yes, I do know I am ready by Ellen Reddy. Yeah, uh, I am woman. Um, so Helen Reddy's song. Helen Reddy just recently passed away. She's the one of the co-writers for the I, I Am Woman. Hear me, hear me roar. And um, I was well, just called I Am Woman. But I Am Woman is this beautiful, uh, very you know, it just moves. It's 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 just such a great message for women of any time period as to how they're going to go and proceed to be all the things that women have been from yesteryear to what they have to be in the modern time where they're pursuing careers. And it's, um, they made a jazzier version of it for the Dean Martin show. And Jane Kennedy is, does the solo in that song along with the, the backup singers who are the, um, there's a couple of names for them, but the Dean Martin dancers are, they called the, <laughs> they're called the Dingling Dancers and the Gold Diggers. There's a couple of different names for them, but, Nonetheless, they were a group of multi-ethnic um, women who were dancers on the show and singers, and she was one of them. And she made that, I think, when she was about 23. And she she has said that before. She's like, when I sang that song, it was going to be the song. She didn't realize it at the time, but that's the theme song for her life. That's how she feels right. about it. So that's why I ended the film with with that final beat. And it works perfectly. The camera, the camera um, sequence on the show works perfectly for my credits. <laughs> <laughs> works perfectly for every reason and it does it always brings me to to tears i mean i'm always like ah you know there she is you know this is what she came to do and she did it many times over okay i just have three more fun questions for you that nothing about your film if that's okay <laughs> oh, <yeah>. um <laughs> your first time on that's my show i, I always i always ask people their favorite film mm -hmm. oh yeah okay let's see um I would say, well, it's two films. 
but oh. because they're in different categories. But one, it would be uh, Spike Lee's Malcolm X with Denzel exactly. Washington as the lead. It's just an incredible, it's to me the most perfect biopic and I would like to be a biopic director. So t- for me, that is the standard <laughs> in terms of the editing and the score, the performance, um, even the fact that like how my film ended with the song, that's how his film ends with the Aretha Franklin song. It's I the way that he structures that film. I intend to structure all my biopics exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then my other film, which is my favorite, is The Wiz and Diana Ross and Michael Jackson and uh, uh, Nipsey Russell and all, uh, you know, everybody. Lena Horne is in the film. I mean, Richard Pryor's in the film. And it's just such a, it, I just remember watching it. Like it, back, in the day, back in the day, they would just have movies on television networks that would just play yep. forever. <laughs> Like yep. every, every Thursday at three o'clock, they play the same. So I would watch these films for years, and I, I just thought, like, oh, that's the Wiz channel, I guess, right? You know, <laughs> I don't know why? But the show, the movie would never end. So I would be dancing like all over my babysitter's living room to all the pieces in the Wiz, and I'm just, and it's just a, a, an uplifting, brilliant film. It's because of Quincy Jones's uh, score, and Sidney Lumet is the director of of the Wiz, and I love, I just that film just makes me instantly happy. And the soundtrack, uh, let alone all the performances and the directing. And it's a fantasy sure. film. So One documentary you will make of the future, but you haven't got to it yet. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, um, so I went to Howard University. That's what the shirt's about. And so my, uh, at the time, we, I lived in a house that was like filled with artists and you had to audition to be in this house. And so one of the artists who was in the film was Chadwick Boseman. And so my oh. first films were made with Chadwick Boseman. So I, I do intend to make a documentary about, with all the footage that I have with his, that chapter of his life, similar to the Jane film where it's just a brief window. It's not about his whole life. It's not all everything in the world. It's just this one window of time when he was at Howard and directly after Howard, where he was launching his career and um, the reason I want to do that film is because, you know, I know many people, of course, do not know him and personally, but they still miss him. But I think that they also are missing the character Black Panther because because they don't know him but the thing is you know if you're an eight-year-old kid you can't grow up and be black panther anyway that's a fictitious character but you can take on the philosophies of a man named chadwick aaron bozeman and live your life in a way that he is similar to the fashions the way he lived his life to reach the zenith of his purpose and that's the gift that i want to give to people who don't know him personally and obviously now they will not have that opportunity but they can get to know him the way that i knew him and that others knew him in this really critical window of time in his life in his early 20s where he was making decisions about the type of man that he was going to be the type of the way where he was going to lend his talent in this world and um, sticking to his guns about having dignity in all of his roles and he didn't know it of course at the time but having having to play the role of someone who wasn't formerly ill and then having to play a superhero many times over. And so, you know, it's very hard for me to watch the films that he made during that time period because I'm just always concerned that he's in pain and I'll know it, I'll know it. I'll see it in one, you know, frame and I'll, you know, just, it, it's gonna hurt me that he's hurt. And so I want people to, you know, know how he set off, set started his life. So yeah, a, ch- a documentary about, Chadwick, um, Chadwick Aaron Bozeman during his Howard years. And I want everyone to go to Howard University. <laughs> it's the best school ever. You're just surrounded by people who are going to be history makers and legends. And you, and you know it, you can feel it. And it's, it's just, that's the, you know, that's the brand of the university and people who change, who put the place back, the whole country back on its, on the side of right. Where that's what, that's what people do who are graduates of Howard. That's what they encourage us to do. And that's what Chadwick did. So. Okay, last question. One film you always recommend to people to watch they've never heard of? Wow, oh my gosh, that's such a great, that's a great question. That's a fantastic question. A film that they must watch, must watch, must watch. Okay, it depends on the individual. Um, and what well, I'm they right want. here, so pitch me. I know, like what is the film that you have to see that really, so a film that's not very well known? Correct, usually I prefer oh, that. Yeah. I would say, because people from now may not know about The Twilight Zone with Rod Sterling. Rod Sterling, and so it's not a film, but it is shot in a cinematic way, but the entire series, like just block off a week. 
watch the, it's the twilight work. zone they, yeah it's just because he you can see the the hope that he has for the future of the country and the world and he takes all of that and turns it into a science fiction um allegory and from that you hopefully can derive you know the the future issues and I, I i watch it all i watch rod sterling's twilight zone all of the time like I, if it ends i go back to the beginning and watch it all over again wow. because it's just it's kind of like how like fahrenheit 451 or um uh, solian green or like animal farm um any of those film any of those books that are hard heavy, heavy <laughs> reading you're giving people here yes and so he's but he does it in a way where it attracts you it attracts you in so that you can then get the lesson and then you're like he was always making films about that were based in what was happening at the time but he was he would just disguise them as something that was science fiction and i mean i can see exactly what he's trying to say and what he did say and he always cast black people in really brilliant wonderful roles i and i i wish i could have met him and thanked him for that because every episode of the twilight zone where there is an african-american actor he had so much respect and love and for what the at the time the american negro person is going through and he does his part in trying to make it fair i mean he really does that and he did it he accomplished it he didn't try he succeeded <laughs> you know and i really appreciate him for that and that's why one of the reasons i watch twilight zone and also jordan peele really loves the twilight zone that's why he made black mirror you know that was a big influence for him as well so it's it influences a lot of a lot of people's work who hide social issues in the science fiction realm and i hope to do that too i hope to hide in the science fiction realm <laughs> you'll get there you'll get there last question Brilliant. Before I let you go, tell everybody where they can find all your work. And I don't think they could see this yet, except for the film festival circuit. You can correct me. Yes, but they definitely can't see it unless they go and pay money to see it. <laughs> this is not a YouTube clip. Um, so uh, my work would be primarily on the festival circuit right now. And it is in most cities along the East Coast in Atlanta, Minneapolis, San Antonio. You know, I'm, I, I am trying to get it in at least the top 25 cities in America. And then eventually I would love for someone who's really, really rich to <laughs> give me all the money so I can put it on TV and <laughs> that would be great. But my other work to date is on my website, which is www.mpirefilms.com. So it's empirefilms.com without the E. So it's empire films begins with an M dot uh, com. And that's where pretty much you know, people want to get in touch with me. That's a great, I mean, you can get in touch with me by my name too, but my name is spelled weird. It's S-A-F-I-Y-A and then S-O-N-G-H-A-I. And that's on all the usual places, the Instagrams and the Facebooks and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, but that's, that's me. <laughs> and and um, yeah, I mean, I have been asked to direct other films after seeing the Interception film. And I would love to, you know, bring other people's stories to life who, you know, who they would like the film, to, they would like their story to be told in the same fashion I told Interception, Jane Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you too. I'm going to come to Toronto. I'm going to hang out with you. Okay. <laughs> We're going to watch movies. It's going to be great. You're right. <laughs>